No matter how much suffering you went through, you never want to completely let go of those memories because those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This quote rings more true on the macro scale of history rather than on an individual level, but this is obviously related to One Piece in more ways than one, and I want to redirect you to a quote within One Piece that I think solidifies this thematic within the story. On chapter 99, titled Luffy Died, it says at the very start, legends that endure in the future were events that took place in the past. I think this line tells us a considerable amount about the missing parts of the story left in One Piece. In a lot of ways, the story that we have followed over the last 1000 plus chapters is a legend in itself. I wouldn't be surprised if we see that these events that we followed were mirrors of similar events over the past 800 years in One Piece, but also within the Void Century. That being said, by that same notion, the events of the Void Century might reflect some things we see in the last saga of One Piece. More specifically, Luffy and his crew will have to overcome what caused the original Joy Boy's failure that allowed the world government to command control of the entire world. In this video, I want to shed some light on the void century that has been left in the shadows of this story. I found evidence of what the One Piece world looked like before the void century. So for those who watch my channel, this is the void century video. And so if you're new to my channel, the way I view the world is by making connections. So let me connect you to my vision, the par vision. So let's start this conversation about what we know about the void century. Honestly, we actually know a lot of different pieces, despite not knowing anything about where those pieces fit. So in short, the One Piece world as we know it in modern times was built on an unknown foundation. Everyone understands that the world government regulates most global affairs and are surrounding the de facto gods of One Piece, the Celestial Dragons, who claim to be the descendants of the creators of the world. The problem is, no one is allowed to know of how this ruling entity came into power in the first place. The current year in the One Piece world is 1524, and so the years that consist of the Void Century are from the years 600 to 700 in the One Piece verse, which is about 800 years ago. It's widely accepted that the world government came into power coming out of the Void Century, but it's a mystery as to what transpired over that time. To further instill how weird that is, think about most world powers we have in our world. We have pretty explicit details about the events that transpired that brought those countries into power power in the first place, and if we didn't, could you imagine the conspiracy theories that would run rampant? The world government bans any form of research into that time period, which makes you even more curious as to why. When Professor Clover was simply proposing the name of the kingdom that existed prior to the world government, he was shot on the spot. The citizens of Ohara, including Professor Clover, had pieced together that these giant cubicle indestructible rocks contained a secret cipher that provided insight into the void century. It was being understood that by collecting the messages across these stones, one could figure out the history of that missing void century, which is why the world government has banned research into them, and simply the presence of the stone on Ohara warranted an immediate buster call response aimed at wiping the entire island and all of its residents. This event, by the way, destroyed the accumulation of 5,000 years of history and research or was an attempt at destroying that legacy at the minimum. So that being said, we actually have two points in the story where it seems like Oda gave us what the Void Century, if not looked like, at least felt like. The second one was this scene where the Kozuki are making the Poneglyphs. I'm curious if this was an exaggerated image or if the Poneglyphs were in an assembly line kind of looking situation being created in the heat of whatever war was at hand, desperate to get these Poneglyphs made and also shipped out to safe locations. That being said, the first time was a little bit more interesting. It was with the Tentadas. With the Tentadas, their history was really unique as they claimed to have a very in-depth log of their history prior to the Void Century and it was stated that the land was ruled by the Don Quixote. Then during the Void Century, they have no idea what happened and then after the Void Century, the Riku family took over and also tried to reform the nation as well as make reparations. This is a very interesting point by the way because from all the things we can inference, things must have gotten worse after the Void Century for 
for the entire world. But in the Tentata's case, two kind of opposite things happen. The Celestial Dragons and the world government took power, which is implied to be a bad thing as they are our current antagonists, but as a result of this, the Tentata's lands were free from the tyrannical abuse of the Don Quixote family. Which by the way, can we pause to take a look at this depiction of the Don Quixote King? Doesn't that kind of look like Blackbeard? At least the nose looks similar, right? But all of this makes me wonder about a nation like Arabasta, where the royal family could have been celestial dragons but chose to stay on the blue sea rather than going to the holy land. There was definitely something different about Arabasta and possibly what they had access to. See, an interesting point about all of this is the storyline we get with Dressrosa. Doflamingo as an exiled celestial dragon expressed his disdain for his ancestors for giving up this land, and that it was rightfully his. While I don't think Doflamingo knows the true history of the world, it is an interesting line of logic, right? Like if I were a king of a nation, and a prosperous one at that, then why would I in victory want to give up my land afterwards? This kind of makes it sound like the Nefertari family was the most reasonable one here. You'd have to make me give up my land for something better. And I mean, we haven't seen the Holy Land too well, but from what we saw, it doesn't look all that impressive. The only thing these butt cheeks thought was better was probably the slave labor. But regardless of that, would you really give up being a king of your own island to live in a gated neighborhood? Like I'm pretty sure if you could be the king of Hawaii versus being in a gated neighborhood in the Hamptons, you'd probably choose to be king of Hawaii, right? So then we have to look at reasons as to why this move seemed more attractive to the celestial dragons rather than staying as kings of their own lands, and a clue might be in what does Arabasta have that other nations didn't have. The current Arabasta doesn't seem all that desirable, but who knows what the Arabasta of ancient times was like. Oh wait, I might, but that'll be in a future video. That being said, the Celestial Dragons from what we see are wearing these astronaut looking suits. They don't look super functional as I'm not sure how the bottoms work, but it seems like in the outside world or lower realms, the Celestial Dragons use this to prevent breathing in the air of peasants, which I have a bunch of theories regarding the origin of these suits, but I'll elaborate on those ideas another time. For now, let's just say these suits were a multifaceted protection apparatus, where they find themselves underwater or in an un inhabitable environment, these suits protected them. So that makes you wonder what they faced in the void century to justify such an excessive tradition. And I say excessive because their literal leaders and hidden god doesn't seem to have this kind of attire. In fact, you could take this scene with the Gorosei and Shanks as subtle proof of either two directions. Well, many more, but relevant to this point, either the oxygen air tanks are literally pointless and the Gorosei know that, or Shanks is not a commoner and they're willing to share the same air as Shanks. But not that I don't think Shanks could be a celestial dragon, there's always a possibility until there isn't, but it seems like the Gorosei are fine with random navy and guards in their space as well. And it's not like they are super annoying about these people being of lesser status and tainting the air that they breathe. But now combining this point with the previous ones, it would make sense if the 20 kings had to leave their original lands because of some worldwide phenomenon that was going to take place that would have left their original land in tatters, or at the minimum made it meaningful to leave their lands. Maybe some lands became apocalyptic due to the nature of what we're talking about. And if you're not sure what I'm referring to yet, this might be when the original first great cleansing took place. Which makes you wonder what the Great Cleansing even looked like back then, or if there even was one, or why there was one. On top of that, has it happened already? Has it happened again and again throughout history and we just don't know? For example, in my Nolan video, I was alluding to the idea that the Gorosei might have used things like the tree fever and amber lead disease as soft ways to wipe out particular populations, which would be really interesting and extremely out of pocket. But we are getting to a point where it could make sense given Chopper basically fought against this kind of warfare when Queen debuted all of his pathogenic weapons. Chopper says that these methods should never be used because you could easily lose control of the situation, and that line really made me think that this is probably not the last time Chopper is confronted with a situation like this. But then you know what that made me realize? The Celestial Dragons could have also been disease control too. Look at what happened on Zunisha when Jack invaded with Caesar's gas weapons. We see the exact same setup with these air bubbles 
suits. I think these kinds of suits were introduced to us on Punk Hazard due to Caesar's powers and his various deadly projects. That being said, Punk Hazard is a very interesting location because from what Law said, there's two really standout things about Punk Hazard. Well first, according to Crocus, all normal islands, I say normal excluding Zunisha because it doesn't really count in this, but all normal islands within the Grand Line have a magnetic signature that are able to be recorded by a log pose. But Punk Hazard is the only island that is currently the only exception that we know of right now. According to law, this is because it was a military research base, implying that the world government could actually remove log pose signatures from an island somehow. But the other important note was that law said they always use this island for this purpose of experimentation and research, which makes you wonder how far back did Punk Hazard exist and what purpose was their research for back then. It's crazy because we already know by now, you can sort of taste that all of these elements that were present in the past might be resurfacing to take action again in our timeline. So in our timeline, there hasn't been a great cleansing yet. So let me ask you, if there were one now, what do you think it would look like? If we are saying it might be a repeat of the past? Do you think the whole world was flooded? Do you think there was some mass disease? Everyone was slaughtered? Was the world overpopulated? Or do you believe in my white sky century theory? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And before I give you my answer, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can hear all of my answers whenever you want. And so right now, I think my answer is all of the above. I think that everything that we've seen in the story used in a great war was definitely probably a microcosm of what happened in the past. But here, before we move on, let's do a quick Parvision flashback for those of you rusty on my ideas around the Void Century. If you remember from my Shadows theory, there were two major points at the end about the Void Century. The first one that I really like was in regards to the dawn of the world. It seems like various groups related to the ancient weapons, poneglyphs, or void sentries are waiting for the dawn of the world. The dawn might be referring to the title Sun God, and that title was given to Nika, who I presume to be of the void sentry. So basically, the Sun God brought on the dawn, but the dawn from what? And why were the people so starved for the dawn? We'll get to that point later, but so if you can say that Nika probably lost during the Void Century, which makes sense to me because if Nika won, we probably wouldn't have had the Void Century and come to a future where Eam is in power, or the world government for that matter. Which brings me to an interesting point. Usually when an era or time period is named, it's usually named after someone, like Gold Roger brought on the Golden Age of Pirating. And so I want to take us back to chapter 504 for probably one of my favorite lines in all of One Piece. Doflamingo says slavery is old news. The new era is of the smile. That line is so multifaceted. The obvious thing he was speaking about was the smile fruits being manufactured by his Yonko operation under Kaido. That being said, I think this line brings so many meanings now that we know Luffy is sun god Nika. Nika meaning grin or smile. You could also understand that line as the idea that the era of Nika will end the era of slavery, which is the exact backstory given to us about Nika, that he liberated slaves, which now we can connect back to the void century, right? Because we know the Tentadas were enslaved and who knows who else. And it would make sense that had Nika succeeded, then maybe it would have been the era of the smile or Nika or Nika's century back then. And we wouldn't have our story now where when Luffy wins, he'll ultimately succeed where those past entities failed. With that in mind, did you catch what I said about Nika's century and naming an era? This line of logic led me to believe that it might be possible that it's not the void century, it might be more accurate to say it's Void's century, and that Void was the god opposing sun god Nika during the Void century. Void ended up winning and having the multi-meaning name attributed to their victory. Now, this is just a theory proposed as an alternative to the popular four god theory, but if you're interested in the idea, go check out my shadows theory afterwards because next I will be playing a clip from that video and both of these ideas combined are maybe 10% of the entire theory explained there. Again, if you like this video so far, consider subscribing and liking the video. As I always say, I can only make this kind of content with all of your support. So here is the flashback about an interesting possible double meaning in the name of Void Century. This is the era of the smile. I think he was right. 
because slave trading was something that was abolished even after the void century but returned. And so it seems like slavery is the mark of an old era. And Nika means smile or grin, right? So the new dawn might be the era of Nika, or in other words, the era of the smile. Which is kind of wild when you think about it. But wait, you know what that would imply, right? That would imply that Void Century was also named after someone or something. So that's when my mind went racing. Because if Nika is the Dawn and he awakened 800 years ago, probably through Joy Boy, then maybe the antithesis to Nika was Void. Meaning the other god that opposes Nika might be named Void. Since Nika supposedly lost back then, Void probably won, thus dubbing it the Void Century. The name of the other god could have been in our face this whole time. It could have been something like, and hear me out, I haven't stuck to any name yet, there's a lot of iterations, but considering Nika might have been a derivative from the Greek goddess of victory, Nike, maybe the antithesis would also have Greek roots, also tying in the presence of the ancient weapons. Like if Shirohoshi was a devil fruit, wouldn't her fruit be the mythical Zoan human fruit model Poseidon? So maybe the name of this other god or other fruit would be the Chaos God Void. But Chaos never really came up before. It could be the Dark God Void, and Void being the actual name of the god, or another option could maybe be Darkness God or Void God Uranus. Yes, the last ancient weapon. I have three different outcomes for saying that and I still have to think about this part. But to kind of explain, well, earlier I said chaos because in Greek, chaos means emptiness or void. It can mean space or infinite darkness. So chaos in modern mythology refers to the primordial state before creation, strictly combining two separate notions of primordial waters or primordial darkness, from which a new order emerges and in in this case, that would refer to the dawn of the new world, wouldn't it? And interestingly, Phersides of Syros interpreted chaos as water. So maybe Emu is the chaos god Emu because Emu reverses Umi, which means ocean. And it might be possible that the void century is named after Emu. That is a possibility. Next, there's so many ways this can go that all sound really cool and awesome, but so why is Uranus tied to this void god thing? Well, Uranus was supposed to be the Greek deity that rules the sky, or rather is the embodiment of the sky, right? Also, I want to point out that the naming scheme of the trio ancient weapons are odd. Uranus would be the odd one out in terms of mythology, which I'll dive deeper later. But so sky, why is the sky important? Well, let's take another closer look at the name Void Century, specifically at Void. So Void Century has been written like this in kanji, which apologies for my pronunciation would be Kuhaku no Hyaku Nen, and we translate it to the Void Century. So Kuhaku would specifically be what is translated to Void. It could also mean blank or space or empty. Do you see a parallel to the Greek word chaos yet? Okay, cool. Now it gets crazier. So this is the kanji for Kuhaku or Void. And you know Oda likes to make a play on words, and I was thinking, hmm, given the word means blank or space, what would happen if you put a space in the kanji? And that's when I realized what each of these kanji means separately. So if you separate the symbols for Kuhaku, you get the symbol for Sora and the symbol for Shiro. If you watched anime as long as I have, you don't even need Google Translate for that. Yes, the symbols for void in Void Century are sky and white, or white sky, which is crazy for so many reasons. So our tour clarified to me that the symbol for Sora could mean sky, but it could also mean void or empty, because the sky is generally empty. So instead of white sky, it could be white void, which is still crazy because you could kind of read this as the white sky century rather than the void century. So in the video, I was talking about a lot of different connections to the sky. I mean, a lot of people believe Vivi is Uranus and commanded the rain, or maybe she is the rain god. But I do have a video saying that Buggy could be the rain god. But that video aside, we have sky islands on clouds, and we have a lot of interesting lore and even power-ups relating to the sky. For example, a fully covered sky severely cripples the minx in an all-out battle where the moon 
Moon is present. In the original video, I proposed that Emu or Blackbeard would have sky-related powers connecting back to the Void Word. But more than any of this, if the sky were totally covered in clouds in the Void Century, that would explain so many things. And so to finally answer the earlier question of what happened in the Void Century, I think it was a mixture of everything. But the only concrete clue is that the sky was probably completely covered in clouds, except for the red line, the sky islands, and possibly a few select locations, meaning the white sea stretched the entire planet and it explains so much of the geography that we see. But you're probably thinking right about now, but wait, Parvision, you just said a concrete clue. I thought the white sky century was just a theory at the moment. No, I think at the minimum, I found a set of panels that proves that something happened and for that thing to have happened, the best explanation I have at the moment is that the entire world was covered in clouds at one point. So what is the panel I'm talking about? I don't mean to build the suspense, but in my past dreams and videos, I said this panel was in relation to Frankie. It's also related to Vegapunk, and it's also related to Anel. I told these clues to separate groups of people excited to see if they'd catch on to what I was talking about, and no one succeeded. Not even the One Piece wiki takes note of this detail. So for this, let's talk about what I think is the most reviewed cover story in One Piece, Anel's cover story. Except the current cover stories are kind of cracked, but yes, the clue lies in this series of cover stories. The panel I said that Oda had drawn that has to be at least in the void century if not prior, or at least it makes the most sense for this situation to be the case. Okay, so let's do a quick read through for Anel's cover story. I want to clarify, there's a bunch of things in this cover story that I will address in future videos, but for the sake of time and this theory, I'll try to limit my ADHD tangents, no matter how exciting they are. So when we start off, Anel arrives at the moon and he sees an automata, and later we learn this automata is from Dr. Tsukimi. But so through some form of logic, Anel recognizes that there'd be some benefit to blasting this already dead looking little creature with lightning and ultimately revives it. So this army dressed automata finds his companions, which their outfits are really interesting and I might make a video about that. And so then we see a space pirate come in and shank Anel's new buddy. Anel no diffs this fodder pirate and then we see images of the space pirate crew excavating moon ruins it seems. And then we get to the most important part of this reread. So the army automata gives us a flashback of his birth on an island where Dr. Tsukimi is making it from scratch. He is eating dong with his automata buddies and then he sees the moon explode. He chokes on a dango and dies. And his automatas fly up to the moon on balloons and they confront the space pirates and lose. And then we see right after the flashback Anel props himself up as their savior in the sense the automata recognize that Anel had avenged them. So that's as far as I have to go in terms of the reread portion here. So let's talk about this. A question, when do you think the automata came to the moon? By the way this story was told, it makes it feel like Anel came onto the moon and just prior to him, the automata were defeated. But I'm here to say that is impossible. I'll explain why in a second. One thing I will address in a future video is that there's some sort of paradox we have when it comes to the automatas themselves. We see at the end, it seems like there was a storage of automata on the moon with wings. And it would make the most sense if they originated in Burka, the ancient moon city, which would be prior to the void century. But then we have this statement from Oda that this army automata was born on that island by the hands of Dr. Tsukimi. So there's some kind of missing link here, explaining how either Dr. Tsukimi's automata ended up on the moon, or how the sky races seem to have barely any recollection of their moon ancestry. But yet Dr. Tsukimi got his hands on the same exact blueprints. So it would seem that at a minimum, Dr. Tsukimi connected with the ancient Birkin race at some point, but that's not why I'm saying this was a long time ago. Another the reason is that well in the flashback the moon was half exploded. I'm sure if that happened in our timeline then we would have heard about half the moon covered in an explosion. I imagine Dr. Tsukimi probably wouldn't have been the only person to die of shock as a result of this event. But even though that makes sense too, that's not why I think this was a long time ago. My current understanding is that this automata was here for a long time and the space pirates it fought might not be the exact same either. This detail is 
is very slight, but the main space pirate looks like it could be a clone. While the outfits match up from flashback to current time, the difference is the spear weapon. They both had spears, but the current timeline spear looks way more advanced. The space pirates could be clones to mask the time change. And technically, the detail about the automatas being robots helps support the idea that these automatas weren't here for a short period of time. It could have been a long period of time before they were rebooted by Anel. And we can see a direct example of that very thing when we see the long dormant automata in Burka being revived in the same way. It makes you feel like the automata are from different time periods, but the reality might be that they are closer in time to each other than Dr. Tsukimi's automatas are to Anel. But again, this is not why I think this. There was a detail slyly left out of all of this explanation, and Oda is a legend for making this cover story the way he did. But okay, let's look at what island Dr. Tsukimi was from. So many people have made this connection to Vegapunk, but here's something that is new. It says Karakuri Island. It looks nice and warm and looks like they're sitting on a Japanese style patio type of structure, which is interesting for my theory regarding the Amatsuki clan and the last saga, but I'm sure some of you realize the giant red flag about this description of Karakuri Island. Let me reiterate, this is Karakuri Island, and it's warm and summery and Japanese? If you remember what Karakuri Island is, you already know how absurd this sounds. This is the Karakuri Island we know from Frankie's time skip training island. Karakuri isn't just a cold island, it was one of the few winter islands we know of. And it's not just a cold winter island, it's so cold and desolate that when Vegapunk was a kid, he created an entire project to harness the geothermic energy underneath the island to then heat it up and return it to apparently it's a former state? Now I know there's a lot of difference in opinions of when Vegapunk is from, especially now that we see Vegapunk now in 2022. Keep in mind I wrote most of this at the start of 2022, regardless of when he is from, this part of the theory still holds true. But according to the grandpa on Karakuri Island, he seemed to know Vegapunk personally as a kid, and further indicated by the fact that when Vegapunk failed, he said Vegapunk wanted to help them specifically and cried for them, and due to that behavior, the citizens grew closer to Vegapunk. And the factories here are where Vegapunk spent his childhood. It could be that this was simply one of Vegapunk's satellites as we know of now, but I still think Vegapunk is more relative to our timeline, and when he originated on Karakuri Island, Island, it was so cold that he wanted to save everyone from that cold. And going back to that point about Karakuri Island, not even the wiki addresses this point, that despite being a winter island for some reason in our timeline, when Dr. Tsukimi was there, it was definitely not a winter island. And by the way, this is no offense to the wiki, and this is by no means slandering them. I love and respect them, and apparently not only do I rely on them heavily, but also Oda apparently does too for the catalog of past movements names that he uses when writing the story. So I just want to pause here and say thank you to the One Piece wiki. But back on point, how does an island go from this summer paradise to this desolate freezing wasteland? I think the one possibility that's in our face right now is Aokiji's power. It does make sense that maybe a past user of Aokiji's fruit created Karakuri Island like he did to Punk Hazard. And while I'm not separating Aokiji from this theory, I think it would be a little excessive to say that Aokiji's power was the cause of all the winter islands. But that's not to say that at least within the Grand Line, there's probably an unnatural cause for these winter islands to exist. We also know that geothermal heating apparently failed, which could imply that the solution to fixing the winter islands lies somewhere else. So then we're left with this idea that for Karakuri Island to go from this to this, I think the best explanation was that the world went through some sort of ice age that changed the climate of these islands, and certain islands retained those properties. So what could cause an ice age of this magnitude? And so this real world theory wasn't exactly debunked, but was given a lot more context in the last decade. But so covering the entire sky with clouds and blocking out the sun could be how you could achieve a situation where part of the world would freeze over. Now just to clarify, one of the main contingencies that we understand now is that based on the altitude of the clouds covering the sky, you could either get a hotbox effect creating a boiling world or you can get an ice age effect. So given Oda probably came up with the void century a long time ago, I had imagined the best way to think about this is that by covering the entire sky, you would freeze over the world and cover it in darkness. 
and the world going through an ice age makes a lot of sense for so many context clues, and we'll try to get through as many as we can within this video, but I might have to cover some of them separately. But so for the first one, Ors the Continent Puller. I've always wondered why he was named the Continent Puller. I think Zunisha is more accurately a Continent Puller. Ors is not nearly the size or even the presence that I would assume would be required to move a continent. For one thing, is Ors more accurately the continent swimmer or dragger? Because how would Ors pull something through the water? It's not like Zunisha where Zunisha actually touches the sea floor as they walk. Ors could not do that. But if part of the world was frozen, then Ors could have a much easier easier time pulling a frozen island across the world. And this is supported by the fact of how Ors died. One thing Moria tells us is where he found Ors. It was in the land of ice. And this was chapter 456, which by the way, look at what the chapter cover is and the title is. The demon from the land of ice. All of these details lining up for this story here. But so later we learn from Chopper that not only was Ors found in the land of ice, but after what I guess would be a very late autopsy, Chopper deduced that Ors died from frostbite and it was the cold that killed him and says a really important line, even a monster as big as him can't stand a chance against the power of nature. He must have got caught in the cold and died of exposure because 500 years ago, Ors must have also walked around naked. This line is meaningful to me in so many ways, but the power of nature. Have I not been emphasizing this in the last few videos? The last saga will definitely be emphasizing this a lot more. But it's interesting, right? Apparently Ors lost his original right arm to frostbite. I wonder what Ors was reaching for. I wonder if Ors was holding on to something or someone. Maybe it's a repeat of Drum Island where Luffy had to climb a mountain to save his friends. Maybe Ors promised to hold on to something and he died doing it. Anyways, I'll get back to Ors later on because there's some other cool connections. I mean, you guys would hurt me if I didn't mention the Yeti Cool Brothers and their supposed mystery race of giants that they are. It would make sense if their lineage originated from some situation with the giants and an ice age. From Saul, we do get an understanding that there seems to be other locations with giants other than just on Elbaf, which is interesting that Saul called them savages, when from what we've seen so far, the giants seem to be pretty respectable. They live too long to be out of pocket like us lame humans with lame lifespans. And speaking of the lamest humans, let's talk about the Celestial Dragons again. If there was not just an ice age, but a planned ice Sage, that would be an incredibly good reason to escape your homeland. But what I want to talk about was more than that is how they talked about the world. See, they divided the world into an upper realm and a lower realm, which is just interesting to me because from all versions of how this goes down, it's not like the celestial dragons originated in the upper realm, and it's not like they created the upper realm. Their true story apparently is that they stole this land from the Lunarians. But let's not get too far into that point just yet. What's more interesting is the naming of the realms. So we have an upper realm and a lower realm. And I was thinking, well, if the sky was covered by clouds, but even without that, couldn't it also be said that the lower realm is the underworld? And that's important for so many reasons, right? This concept of the underworld has been plaguing our minds for a while now. Zoro is a king of hell. Pluton is related to the underworld too by name. And there's the idea that the Grim Reaper we saw facing Zoro has some connection to the underworld. And amongst all of the theories I've heard, there was one where someone said that the Grim Reaper was Pluton's Kabaterman in my live stream for chapter 1053, I believe. But none of this is what I want to focus on just yet. I want to focus on Brook. Brook's revive fruit is another great mystery that I'll deep dive in a future video. But since we're talking about ice and that ice age creating a pseudo underworld, then we gotta talk about the dead straw hat crewmate Brook, who has ice powers and says it's the chills of the underworld. Something that I always thought was interesting was that it almost seems like the One Piece world was going to introduce different realms through Brook and Zoro. But the way souls work in One Piece is that it should have traveled to the land of dead after he died. But due to the fruit enabling him to somehow expend a huge amount of energy, his soul remains in the human world, but also can interact with it as well. Now, what's interesting is the concept of the soul going to the land of the dead. What if it weren't a separate location? What if Brook's soul was already in the land of the dead? Meaning it all coincided, which makes a lot more sense, right? I mean, if you watch my Nolan video, I was emphasizing the graveyards, especially in Ringo and Shandora. 
They have lands of the dead where they believe the souls reside. I mean, specifically in Shandora, the forest of the ancestors were housing the souls of the loved ones. Is this where Brook's soul would have gone to? Do only the strong souls stay in the human world? Or maybe also the wicked ones too? Is that why Roger said he won't pass away? I mean, we know it because he was never forgotten, so he truly didn't die. But this line from Whitebeard always stuck with me. Whitebeard said, Roger is waiting for a certain person, and Blackbeard wasn't that person, so it made me think maybe Roger's soul was so strong that it can stay within the world. Maybe that's how the D-Clan has been passing on their wills. Maybe this is related to the creation of Devil Fruits in the first place. But what I want to talk about is maybe there's a land of the dead that souls gravitate to that Brooke is referencing here. We already know that in Shandora that they have the Forest of Ancestors, where it was purported that the souls of the people went here to rest. But take that one step higher. If there's souls inside of trees, haven't most people already thought that devil fruits house souls of some sort? So we know that souls can stay within this realm. But maybe this land of dead that Brooke is referring to is the Ice Continent, for example. Or maybe Laugh has a frozen section or is on frozen land. Or maybe Emu's basement is the land of the dead. Somehow they got the AC on blast in here and apparently Emu has no bills to pay. But that opened up an interesting thought. What if the land of the dead was within the red line? So maybe there's a world where this land of the dead or underworld is actually just within the One Piece verse and it's not like another realm or dimension and the underworld just referred to the world underneath the clouds. It might be that the Blue Sea faced an ice age and became known as the underworld. Something I'll cover in the future is that it might be that the world faced many hells, not just one. Wait, many hells? Does that sound familiar? It might be that Impel Down was made in a way to reflect the outside living conditions for some reason. We discussed this in the video where we found a Poneglyph in Impel Down, which at the end of the day would somehow link Impel Down to the Kozukis in more ways than one. And speaking of connections of the Kozuki clan and Wano, Wano was known as the land of gold in some time after the void century and prior to now, and more accurately during Ryuma's time. I think most people including myself would be like, okay, well, where is the gold? A lot of people have hypothesized that it maybe it was Shandora, and maybe Shandora was dragged out of Wano for some reason, possibly by oars. But what's interesting about any kind of island moving logic is that Kalgara was 400 years ago, and seemed pretty sound in their maintained isolation. If oars who was dated to be just from 100 years prior to Kalgara, I'd imagine somewhere in the history he told Nolan that he'd be like, oh yeah, some giant ancient demon dragged us across the sea here. That's not to debunk the possibility, but naturally you do kind of want to look outside for the gold. So let's take a second to think about gold. Gold Roger? No. Don Krieg? Yes. But no. Tesoro? No. But yeah. Kind of. But okay, what's funny is I think outside of all of these gold examples, there's one huge treasure cache of gold, and it's in the ice continent. Don Chin Zhao claims that the gold was amassed over centuries and by his family, and it's in ice? Also, this ice is not your normal ice. They can't use pickaxes to break it or even melt it efficiently, which is actually true. You can't flamethrower snow because of physics. In the long run, it'd be counterproductive and a waste of energy. But that being said, what if the gold was actually sourced from Wano? I just thought it was interesting that we have a missing gold mine and the one that has been mentioned in the story is under this mysterious ice continent. And Don Chin Zhao specifies that to open it, you must put all of your power into one spot. And I don't know about you, but time and time again I bring up that this is swordsmanship at its finest, right? Like Odin apparently sliced Yama, the white boar mountain god, so cleanly that he basically made a surgical cut at the atomic level where Yama was able to survive being sliced in half. 100% Odin would have been able to crack that ice or any prominent swordsman on Wano could be able to open the vault. I'm curious to find out where this ice continent is and if it does have relationship to Wano. Because there's actually two points of mystery links that I want to present here. One, there's that random scene in the current opening of One Piece where they just show a bunch of log poses in ice, it seems. And currently, that has no relevance to the manga or anime at the moment, so it makes you wonder if it ever will be relevant. 
But more importantly, this is one of the more interesting connections to me. Yamato's Devil Fruit, the mythical wolf Zoan Okuchi no Makami. It has ice powers, which could relate to Ringo specifically, but I wonder if the ice powers were maybe how Wano protected their gold. Because if Wano used to be known as a land of gold, I would imagine the guardian deity of Wano probably protected the gold as well. But also Ryuma was known as a protector too, dubbed Sword God, and the Shusui as a national treasure. But during Ryuma's time, Wano became known as the land of samurai, not the land of gold. And I wonder if it's because the gold was transferred out or maybe there's another meaning to that nickname. Now speaking of Wano, I had this understanding that the two original clans that reigned supreme were the Amatsuki and Kozuki, but the next clan of importance was the Kurozumi, which we'll get to in a second, but then there is also the renowned Shimotsuki clan, the name meaning Frost Moon, and given that Ryuma existed some time after the Void Century, I wonder if it's because the Shimotsuki clan became powerful and known by that clan name due to being the clan that came out during the Ice Age. Which is the perfect transition into some really cool ideas around Wano and the Void Century. See, while this Ice Age White Sky Century could be a form of suppression and a way to enforce oppression, by the same token we can look at some of the outcomes and see if it makes sense that way too. So now let's walk back to the core idea, the entire sky covered in clouds. That has way more ramifications than just an Ice Age. Regardless of the theorized Ice Age, if the sky was covered then, that would create an era of darkness, an era of void. So let's talk about why this also makes sense. How many times have we gone through a country and one way or another, they revere the sun or fire or light? I mean, that's not too telling considering even in our world, we have a similar thing where multiple independent belief systems revered the sun. If the world were engulfed in darkness, then you'd naturally be starved for light. So any power relating to the light would be put on a pedestal. Is that why we see the Mera Mera no Mi so emphasized in the story? And if you think about it, we get an example of a nation starved of the sun, and what do they do? They yearn for it, and create a pirate crew called the Sun Pirates. Fishman Island is an example of what the other countries suffered during the Void Century, and why countries like Elbaf and Wano might both have similar thematic festivals. In Elbaf, they have the Winter Solstice Festival, and we're unsure of Elbaf's exact climate, but they celebrate the death and rebirth of the sun, as if there were a time when the sun didn't rise all the time. And I also think it would make sense that the giants on Elbaf, which has always been tied to Norse mythology, would be the nation that deals with an ice age and overcome it, as they are also one of the main groups of people of the past that weathered the cold being in the Nordic region. But shifting to Wano, Wano's even more interesting. They hold a fire festival, so the flames reach the heavens and they use sky boats to send souls into the sky. But what's weird about that is on the same island there's a completely opposite belief system. This tradition being called the eternal burial in Ringo, where the Shimotsuki allowed their dead to be nearly permanently preserved in ice along with their birth sword. Going back to my Amatsuki civil war theory, there is yet again another interesting contrast here. But the one thing I wanted to highlight is that if fire is so important, especially for a fire festival but also light, then it makes sense why we have a random family like the Kurozumi. All the other Wano families are related to the moon, but despite that, Kurozumi is the one that stands alone, meaning charcoal. It could be that the Kurozumi family rose up as a prominent family that provided fire to Wano in an era of darkness, in an era of void. And fire is something that is thematic to the story. I mean Luffy and Sanji, but also Zoro, Kinemon, and Law, all developing fire abilities. We have the sun god, Arabasta has a sun on their flag, and we can't forget about the sun god mentioned with Kashigami. But let's talk about something really important with Shandora now that we're there. See, they didn't revere gold there. The two things that they did revere were the souls of their ancestors and the bell. The souls being in the trees, which is significant, but the golden bell for bell. Something that always struck me, and I'm sure it hit you in the same way, that bell was called the light of Shandora, despite making a sound. But let's think about it like this. If Shandora was home to all the souls, and the bell was a guiding light to Shandora for the souls, then let's ask ourselves, in what circumstance would a sound be called a light? It would be in the midst of darkness, where there was no light, that even a sound could be synonymous with a guiding light. Which is exactly what happened to Noland, in the midst 
midst of the storm, he still somehow heard the bell ring and claimed it to be the light that extended a hand to him and his crew. So it might be that this bell was named the Light of Shandora because the grand sound acting like a lighthouse for ships in the distance. It could even extend even more than that maybe, that an island or nation had special sounds that they would operate with to signify something specific. Maybe that's also why a warship like the Ox Lloyd had the sacred ox bell that had its own ringing system. And beyond sound, let's talk about one of the most glaring systems we have in One Piece. See, one of the main things I think about when it comes to maritime navigation, it's compasses for sure, which is replaced by log poses because the wonky magnetic fields in the Grand Line, but the other thing is celestial navigation, more commonly astro navigation, using stars, the moon, and the sun to track movement over the ocean, especially at nighttime after the sun sets. Given this is a story about pirates and sailors, it's surprising surprising that we've never even referenced this real world system. And for me, the way I think about it is, well, in the grand line, it wouldn't be super useful. It's interesting that they've never used this. The only real reason it wouldn't work is if the islands were all moving. And it's not like they haven't mapped a lot of the grand line. Maybe not all of it, but regardless of magnetic signatures, it would make sense that the stars would stay true. But that's when I thought maybe the log post system was developed because they couldn't use the stars in the past because the white skies blocked out the lights in the sky that would guide you. This part is honestly so hard to think about though, but I think it definitely does support the cloud sky idea. But the real reason I want to bring up the cloud covered sky again is because while all the nations we talked about could have been affected by it, the one place that probably was exempt from it was the Holy Land, which might be why the celestial dragons moved there in the first place. The other place exempt from the darkness would be any lobby. Though I can't fully explain why, Eni's lobby is also known as Afternoon Island or Never Night Island. So it's really interesting that one of the primary world government strongholds is essentially always bathed in sunlight. What a perfect location that gives a whole new meaning to seeing the light. But let's finally talk about two of my favorite points about the world being covered in clouds. Imagine you were a pirate crew with a great captain sailing the darkness of the oceans. In peril, it would be helpful if your captain could bring light to a dark situation. And what's funny is that is exactly literally what we attribute to the greatest pirate captains who are conquerors. How do we measure the upper limits of a conqueror and even power scale conquerors to a certain extent? It's by their ability to split the sky. Wouldn't that make sense that conquerors were known in this manner if there were great importance to splitting the clouds and reaching the heavens? It might have been that the conquerors were the only ones who could bring the light to their constituents. It could be that Sun God Nika was such a strong conqueror that the skies never dared to cast a shadow upon them. And more than anything, if the skies were covered in clouds, it would explain why there are so many ancient races waiting for the dawn. I would be too if it was a world of darkness. And speaking of darkness, let's tie this in a bow with my original shadows video. If the entire sky were covered in clouds, then we have an explanation of why Moria's fruit is so important because an entire world covered in clouds would become heaven for the Kage Kage no Mi user, otherly known as the master or ruler of shadows who also has the power to enslave others. If you remember Moria's situation, he positioned Thriller Bark within clouds to forever cast shadows on his island to maintain permanent domination, which if this white sky sentry theory is true, then it would give insane power to both the Yami Yami no Mi and the Kage Kage no Mi. And to add on top of that, if the clouds caused an ice age, that would create the literal perfect scenario to preserve corpses for the ruler of shadows to take control over with the shadows. In Thriller Bark, Morio was extremely happy that Ors and Ryuma just happened to be preserved in ice. It wouldn't be odd if the exact sentiment was reflected by the original ruler of shadows that probably existed in the Void Century or the White Sky Century. And for those of you who won't check out the Shadows Theory, I want to remind you that there were only two specific assassination orders handed out by the Gorosei. The recent one was for Luffy's Nika Fruit, and the first one was actually Moria's Kage Kage no Mi when they ordered Doflamingo to kill Moria in chapter 581. 
And whenever I think of the Gorosei and this Ice Age idea, I always go back to the fact that Emu has a frozen vault with a frozen straw hat and who knows what else. So there's definitely something fishy when it comes to the Void Century and I think the clouds are going to play a larger role than we might originally think. If you haven't seen my first theory about Pluton, I would check that out because it fills in a lot of details about the importance of clouds and Wano and so much more. But I want to add something we learned of in some of the most recent chapters. When I originally wrote this theory, I did not know Vegapunk would come into the story so soon and reveal so much. The main things that I want to bring up are the ancient weapons. If we know what Poseidon is and we are wondering what Pluton and Uranus are, and if I'm talking about some sort of power that could cover the entire sky and clouds, then that might be Uranus, which reminder is essentially the embodiment of the sky, not a god. It's the literal sky. That's what Uranus technically means. And the reason I bring this up in the context of Vegapunk is because Vegapunk has already demonstrated to us some insane inventions. To me, it seems like Vegapunk has found a way to create mechanical versions of everything, including ancient weapons. In the introduction, we see mechanized sea beasts, which parallel Shirahoshi's command over sea kings. It's just one step below, but is a very close imitation to the full ancient weapon's power. Then we have the Aircon, which gets passed just as a climate control of a specific island, but how is it facilitated? Vegapunk created a sky island above Egghead to create the climate control, which wait a second, sounds very similar to the White Sky Sentry idea, but would be just a few steps beneath the full White Sky Sentry ability. What's even more scary is that Vegapunk claims that this is possible worldwide, which again sounds a lot like this idea that I'm proposing here of some kind of power that is able to cover the entire sky in white and possibly instigating a mass great cleansing. And I want to add this too. The geography in regards to the red line's altitude is so interesting. It almost makes more sense that the One Piece world was flooded at one point and the water levels rose to meet the red line. So let me ask you, where would that much water even go? Is Eni's lobby the drain? And is Wano the faucet? Because honestly, how does that water keep overflowing? But what if I said that clouds also explain that? You'd probably say, Par, I think your vision is getting cloudy. But hear me out. See, a key detail that Pagaya explained to us was that amongst the ingredients required to form a sky island, the sky islands also absorbed moisture, meaning that the sky islands, though they did not produce rain beneath them, they were made up of water to some extent. The petrified emperor cloud, for example, could contain a sizable amount of water, and if it was larger during the void century, then maybe that's another explanation to the difference in sea levels to the red line. We also discussed the ice continent, which might be different than the land of ice, and both of those would be different than the north and south poles. So it could very well be that the water levels were higher at one point, and these various mechanisms all were used to create the lower realm of the blue sea. Now, I could go on and on about various ice connections, especially considering I didn't even attempt to fit in where Aokiji's power might have originally existed in, but I might have already brought it up in a previous video about how devil fruits are training wheels for peak hockey. But anyways, there's two questions I want to touch on here. Why would they create an Ice Age, but also how? So touching on the first one, I think back to Chopper's line where he says even a monster as big as him, referring to Ors, can't stand a chance against the power of nature. I think what's interesting there, again, the power of nature part, because it just reminds me of Logias in general, and in this context how maybe the world government tried to use all the powers of nature to kill monsters, which I have so many ideas about this which all ties back to Onis. Speaking of Onis, something I didn't address yet was the concept that Queen brought to our attention, that there is a way to create Onis via ice. By freezing their souls and bodies it seems, it seems like you can create artificial Onis. This proposed ice age that occurred could have been the original birth of Onis in One Piece. It might have instigated a large population to become Onis, which was something that backfired in the original plans. Seeing that Punk Hazard also created the numbers and Queen 
Kane created Onis as well, it wouldn't be too absurd to expect that Vegapunk might have some information on this, as well as this being a component of the Void Century. The world had to band together to fight the Onis, but that was the history that was forgotten because of how Onis came to be. The most interesting part of this is obviously that ice is connected to turning people into Onis, and Onis are one of the mysterious races we know nothing about yet. And so if you're interested about Onis, check out my Oni video that has already been released to YouTube members and will be edited soon for the general public. If you like this white sky century ice age idea overall, let me know in the comments. Let me know which part was your favorite, and I'm gonna have to elaborate on some other parts at a later time. But there's so many layers to this idea, and I feel like I only show just the iceberg and scratch just the surface. There's still the flood theory, which is a popular thought, especially given the geography, but I definitely think somewhere in there an ice age must have occurred to force Karakuri Island into the state it is in our timeline. Oh, and it might also explain how some islands like Little Garden were essentially time capsules of the past. It was frozen over and melted out more recently, but maybe that's the overall idea with the Ice Age. The Void Century froze everything and everyone and stopped it in time. Which takes me to an interesting topic to leave off on, the connection between snow and memories in One Piece. And this brings us to chapter 430, titled The Light Snow of Reminiscence Falls. In this chapter, this is when the Going Merry ultimately passes on through the Viking ship burial method of yet again burning the ship to help carry the soul out, which we saw happen. But what we also saw here was that it randomly started snowing, and as the snow fell, the Straw Hat started getting memories of their past history with the Mary. It seems like Oda is infusing this thematic of snow and ice and lost memories. It could be that the way we learn about the Void Century is through snowfall, which actually reminds me of Drum Island, a wintry island full of memories. And ironically, it's where we learn that you only die if you are forgotten. Given so much was forgotten during the Void Century, all of those people actually did die. But both places are places of dreams and and like Blackbeard said, dreams never die. And so if you remember how we left Drum Island, it was with a grand send-off staged by Dr. Kreha, but ultimately initiated by Dr. Hiraluk. He developed a red powder that would combine with the white snow and create a pink Sakura snowfall that was regarded as a dream. If you remember the inspiration for this, it was from some land that Hiraluk landed on in the west that saved his life. It was cherry blossoms that were regarded as the miraculous cure that cleansed his soul. Maybe this is how memories will be restored at Laugh Tale? Maybe this is how the world will have their memories restored overall. The Great Cleansing will be initiated causing snowfall, but then the Straw Hats or maybe Vegapunk recreate the snowfalls of dreams and memories. And so with all of that, I hope you'll never forget this channel because you never know when our connection could be severed. If you watch this video, then I want to thank you for really strengthening our mind ropes and making this journey the dream that it is. If you want to support the channel, check the links in the description box below and get more connected to the vision because I'm really expanding it. For example, if you weren't aware, YouTube members have been getting early access to all of my theories and at the time of posting this video, there will be three videos that have not made it to the general public yet. And to stay as updated as possible, check out my Discord server and my new website. Also, this video connects to nearly all the videos on my channel, even my elemental hockey video. There's too many to count, but I highly recommend checking those out and when you do, comment to let me know how connected you are. With me, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you all on the next part vision. <laughs>